Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. We record these weekly so that you and I can stay in awe and on fire with the burst of inspiration. We bring on guests that we can learn from, borrow wisdom from, grow from. And today we are absolutely going to get all three of those things, plus an awful lot more. I want you to, first of all, to type in where you're tuning in from today. And one thing that has already made your day a good day. So where are you tuning in from today? And one thing that has already, here we are, 11.05 in Central Standard Time here in the United States. One thing that has already made your day a good day. Uh, and so I'll go first. I'm tuning in today from St. Louis, Missouri. My name is John O'Leary. And growing up, I had an awesome mom and an awesome father. And on every single table in our house, we would have books. I, I know that, that that's not unusual for most of us. Many of us had things on tables. You know, maybe you had remote controls for the television sets. Maybe you had ashtrays on the tables growing up. I don't know. We had books. And on every single book that we had on these tables, whether it was a coffee table, a nightstand, a toilet top, whatever it might have been, was the name Max followed by Lakato. Max Lakato. Max Lakato is our guest today. He has sold nearly 150 million books over four decades of authoring these books. Many of them now reside with my mom and dad. So Max, you, you, you owe us brother on that one. If you lined them up, here's a remarkable stat. If you lined up Max's books, you could stack them from San Francisco to New York and back again three times. So this is a remarkably successful author, but he's not on because of that with us today. This is a humble servant. This is a great man. This is a guy who's got a ton of wisdom to share with his readers, with his church, and today, my friends, with you and me. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce you to my friend and now yours. His name is Max Licato. Max, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thank you, John. What a treat to talk to you. What an honor. Hello from San Antonio, Texas. And the good thing that's happened to me already today is getting to meet you. Uh, you may feel differently at the end of the 45 minute conversation, Max. So <laughs> don't pass judgment yet, Max. You, you heard me lay out a little bit of an introduction for you. But now as a father and a grandfather and as a friend, when you meet people for the first time and they they haven't read your books and they don't know that if you stack them up, you could go from San Francisco to New York six times. How do you introduce yourself? Hmm. I, I never, yeah, I don't make a big deal out of the books really. And it, it kind of depends on the setting. Uh, if I'm in a mood to have a conversation, I'll tell people I'm a writer. If I'm in a mood to be quiet, like I'm traveling on a plane, I don't want to com com have a conversation. I'll tell them I'm a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> that is really funny we may come back to that question later on of, hey why why do you think people pull back from the past <laughs> and lean into the author uh, so we'll, we'll come back to that max but i i hear you loud and clear we won't start on the plane i want to start maybe in a little bit of, of a more humble background let's talk about andrews texas that's where you spent the formative years of your life down in andrews texas would, would you begin by just sharing a little bit of, of the backstory of of your mom and dad what was life like for you growing up Nobody goes to Andrews, Texas for a good time. It is a it is a little circle of of desolation in the middle of a big desert of desolation. But it's a great town. Uh, my dad was in the oil field. He was a mechanic in the oil field. He he drove a truck every day out in the oil field and fixed things that were broken. So we grew up anywhere there was oil, and most of my uh, youth was spent in this little town. I'd say little, you know, eight or nine thousand. It was mm -hmm. not tiny, but a, but a, a definitely not a large city. Uh, we had a, a, a terrific family. I'm the youngest of four kids. Uh, my mom and dad uh, were children of the Depression, World War II era. Uh, the they were in their almost in their 40s my dad was 40 when i was born mom was 39 and so by the time i was 18 they had been they'd been raising kids for a long time they were ready to to kick me out of the house 
they they had a great influence on me my high school years however i and into my college years i uh completely dismissed everything they had said and boy i was just a i don't know kind of a combination of a cowboy and a hippie uh i i drank way too much i uh just if there's a prodigal path out there in Andrews, Texas, I found it. Mm. Uh, and it was, it, those were hard years, uh, on my parents because I brought them, brought them a lot of grief. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm very, very grateful that they extended a lot of grace to me when I was 20, when I came back home, both to them and to my relationship with God, uh, found, mm. found an open door waiting on me when I came back. Max, you had a lot of incredibly positive things happen to and with you in Andrews, Texas. You had great parents, without a doubt. You got some great siblings, without a doubt, great memories and some heartache. And this heartache is something that you buried for decades. So the, the question is, number one, is why did you keep this buried for almost four decades? And then secondly, why eventually did you acknowledge the fact that you endured sexual abuse at age 12? I, I, um, I never shared, uh, I didn't really keep it a secret. My wife knew about it. Uh, my, um, well, I started to say someone, I, there may have been a couple of other people. Uh, he, the deal, John, is is that I really felt healed from it. I, I tell this story in one of my books. Uh, and, and I tell how I was on a, a weekend camping trip with a man who was a mentor to me and two or three of my good friends. Uh, but he brought whiskey and he brought plans that were certainly not healthy and not mm -hmm. godly. He worked his way through all of our sleeping bags. And by the time we got back on Sunday night, uh, I just felt like I was so dirty. Mm -hmm. uh, like other predators, he had told us that if we tell somebody, they'll all think that we're the ones responsible. So I kept it a secret. But that Sunday night when I got home, my parents... Uh, uh, told me that we'd had a, the church had had a special communion service that day. So after my parents went to bed, I staged my own communion service, my own Eucharist. Mm -hmm. I, I had milk and potatoes instead of wine and bread, but it was every bit as much a, a communion service as, as what a person might have at church. And I sensed the presence of Jesus uh, heal, bring healing to me. He met me in that moment. It was it was supernatural, and uh, I I felt like I was healed. Uh, yeah. That shame lifted, uh, that hurt lifted. I never felt like I needed to share that story with anybody for my healing. When I did share it was two or three years ago when I felt like it was appropriate to encourage other people. Yeah. It has made me, I think, more compassionate. Uh, I realized that the abuse that others have gone through is far more severe than anything I went through. That was a one-time event. Others have lived with, uh, with with years with a predator under the same roof. So uh, I, while while my as while my experience was horrible, it's made me even more compassionate toward those who've uh, endured just you know dec de 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 years of 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 similar struggle. I'm curious, Max, as you look back at that struggle and as you as a pastor and an author and a sojourner in life, you've encountered so many people who have endured abuse of every stripe, every color, every source. What advice would you have for those who are watching us right now live or who are going to be tuning in later on to the podcast as they look back at their lives and they see this brokenness and the scarredness and this ugliness that follows them? Every time they look in the mirror, they see it. What, what encouragement might you give them? I, um, it's, it's a, it's a tough thing because often the question that that type of abuse surfaces is why would, why would, if there is a God, why would he let this happen? That is a deep and profound question for which there are no coffee table sized answers, no bumper <clears throat> sticker size answers in the opportunity, if I have the opportunity or privilege to walk into that conversation with somebody, we, we ultimately end up talking about the character of God, mm. uh, the personality of God, uh, as, as revealed in the Bible, God is a God of love. And he points out in scripture that 
that God makes it real clear that vengeance is mine. I will repay. In other words, no perpetrator uh, will go unpunished. Now, God's grace is great. And I believe that the man who uh, abused me, I don't know whatever happened to him. But if he turned to God and asked for forgiveness, that forgiveness was right there. And I would rejoice at that thought to know that. But I have no idea. But part of the struggle for those who do endure abuse is uh, that God is that that person is getting off scot free, right. that that person is is is, you know, never going to receive the uh, just uh, com compensation for what he or she did. And that's simply not the case. Now, that person will stand before a just God and that person will receive what that person is, is rightfully due. And of course, as Christians, we believe we're saved by God's grace. So again, I would say, I sure hope that man cast himself upon the grace of God because mm -hmm. he will, he would be forgiven if he, uh, and no one would rejoice more than I, wow. but to think that the Hitlers of the world, the Mussolinis of the world, whoever these people are that have, that have uh, organized or exercised uh, perpetration upon vast people, groups of people, they, they will face a just God. And I think that's part of the, the assurance that we have as, as those of us who have endured those seasons of struggle. Mm. Well, sp spoken like a true pastor and, and a man who's expert on the subject. And yet that wasn't always your desire. You, you at one point in your young professional career imagined being what my grandfather, my dad, and two of my siblings are, an attorney. You wanted to be a lawyer, I read. And, and uh, at about the age of 20, you made this radical pivot from law into ministry. What, what, what changed? Well, uh, thank you for that question. It's, it's a huge one for me. Uh, and, and I'm not sure I would have made a good lawyer anyway, but I was really interested in that, that line of work. Uh, I mentioned that I uh, was really walking a prodigal path in my high school and college career. Uh, I was a very heavy drinker, a partier. Uh, any of you who happen to have teenage daughters, you would not have wanted your teenage daughter to go out with the teenage version of me. Uh, and, and by the time I was 20, I knew my life was headed off the cliff. I mean, it, it was, I come from a family of alcoholics. I knew what alcohol had done to them. And I, and I knew it was about to happen to me. I, I was blessed to have a very good friend who kept inviting me to church. And oftentimes I went with a hangover, but I got in the habit of going. And that church was blessed with a wonderful pastor. And that pastor's message week in and week out was, uh, God loves you. Why don't you just let him love you? Mm. Well, I'd, I'd gotten to the point where I'd, I didn't think God could love somebody like me, John. I was a, I could say I was a drunk. I was a brawler. I was disrespectful of women. I was very misogynistic. Uh, I just didn't think he could love someone like me. Uh, but you know what? Uh, it was... Uh, it kind of came down to either I'm going to trust him or my life is going to spiral out of control. And so I did. I trusted him. And uh, little by little, uh, he began to clean up my act. I like that quote that says, God never says uh, to you, clean up and then come in. He says, come in and I'll clean you up. Mm -hmm. And he began to clean me up uh, little by little. And part of that cleanup in, included the, the change of peer groups. Uh, I, I, I could not, ch I could not influence the guys I ran with. So I needed to change and find a new group of friends. And I found a group of friends who of all things were studying, uh, to go preparing to go to seminary and through their influence, I decided I'd, I think I'll, I'll go into the ministry. And so, uh, uh, I, I changed from pre-law, uh, to, to take some Bible courses that prepared me to, to go into seminary. And all that happened in, in, in my early 20s. I ended up as a missionary in, in Brazil, lived in Rio de Janeiro for five years, uh, then moved to San Antonio, Texas uh, in 1988. Mm. I've been here ever since. So let, let's talk about Brazil for a moment. I would imagine you have countless stories from there that were formative in the man that you eventually became. Two, though, really jump off at me. One of them is that you sent out a little manuscript. And you experienced, I think, what, 14 rejection letters back. You received one that said, you know what, we'll give this young minister working in, and serving as a minister in Brazil a chance to be a published author. 
that's a bold call, actually. Now that you've got what 150 million in print, it seems like the obvious next step. But as a young guy, missionary in Brazil, why did you think that you had something to share with a larger audience? Boy, you've really done your homework. I'm a fan of the the, the subject. <laughs> yeah, I uh, got to Brazil. Uh, our assignment as missionaries from the sending organization was your first job is to do your best to master the language. And so we were given a year to just study Portuguese. And we took Portuguese lessons, I don't know, two or three hours in the morning, then two or three hours in the afternoon. It was pretty intense. Of course, living in Brazil, we had opportunity to practice it everywhere we went. Uh, but I would be pretty language weary by the end of each day. And uh, uh, this was, you know, back in 1983, so it's not like I could log online and watch a movie in English. Uh, there was there was no English anywhere except for conversation with my wife and our friends. So I I began using that time to write. Uh, I, I've always been an avid journalist uh, in the sense of keeping a journal, not in the sense of, of newspapers. And then also I had written some when I was in Miami. So I took a series of articles that I had written. I compiled them into a manuscript. And uh, to be honest, John, it, it was really not an act of courage or faith. I, I just thought, why not try? And so I sent that manuscript out to, as you pointed out, uh, 15 different publishers. And uh, 14 of them said no. And to be honest, I don't blame them. It wasn't that great of a book. It was, it was just a compilation of some articles I had written. Right. But number 15, a publisher in Chicago, uh, Tyndale House Publishing, took a chance and said, you know what, it doesn't hurt, we'll give this kid a try. And so they sent me a contract. Uh, and by the time that first book came out, I had already written a second. And then I wrote a third. And, and so it just seemed to take off. Uh, I loved it. And that was really part of the reason that we moved back from Brazil after five years. I, I had thought I'd spend my life in Brazil and I love Brazil. Uh, but the writing uh, was really moving. And, and, and uh, so I thought it'd be so much better if I could just do everything in one language. You yes. know, I was, I was speaking and talking and teaching in Portuguese all day, every day. And then in the evening, I would try to write in English. And it, while it sounds like that shouldn't be a big of an issue, my little brain was uh, not, not managing the two languages well. So it, it, that was one of the reasons that we in ultimately moved back to the States is so that I could focus on the writing more. When I want to talk now about the other reason, I believe, just from doing a little bit of research on you and, and your heart, you and I share the fact that we both uh, look up to and just love our fathers. And my, my dad's tuning in right now, along with his wife, my mom, and one of their friends, Maureen A. McMo. I saw a comment a moment ago. So we have friends tuning in from Portugal and from Brazil and from Italy and around the United States, including my own parents. But Max, my dad has had Parkinson's disease for 30 years. And I've I've watched this wonderful man slowly physically fade not spiritually not emotionally he's he's still a mountain of a guy he's still who i look up to but i've watched him slowly fade and that's very painful and if you're honest at all about your faith you've got to occasionally say how how could a good loving god allow that to happen to a guy that good that good you had a similar experience with your dad he had als lou gehrig's disease and uh he went through that heartache while you were in brazil can you just talk about what it was like to slowly observe your father fading and what were the challenges you faced in your own faith journey during that time? Um, well, first I send my love to your father. Uh, thank you for being an inspiration and for bringing such a terrific son into the world, both you and your wife. Uh, may the, may the Lord comfort and, and strengthen you. You know, it's really interesting you bring this topic up, John, because this weekend uh, I still preach at our church. I'm not senior pastor anymore, but I preach about 20 times a year. And uh, I'm, I'm bringing a message uh, along the idea of uh, a quid pro quo God, that idea of God that causes us to say, God, I will do this if you will do that. Or if you'll do that, I'll do this. Mm. And so when you talk about my father uh, having been diagnosed with ALS when I was in Brazil, uh, and my father ultimately died from ALS, 
there were more than one occasions in which I said, now, God, I'm here in Brazil. I gave up everything. Uh, and, and I really need you to heal my dad. As if I could say, as if I could negotiate uh, something with God in, in, in return. And so it was a struggle for me in my faith because I really thought that we had a pretty good deal going here. I would go to Brazil and I would be a very sacrificial missionary and give up my last uh, days with my father. In exchange, God would heal my father. I, I just felt that that he would. Had you asked me in those days in Brazil, I would have said, well, he's just going he's gonna to heal him. He did not. He did not. Although my father in heaven, if people in heaven are able to hear these conversations. He's smiling because he's been healed. He's mm -hmm. been healed. And that pro every promise that God gave him came true. So it was a struggle. It was a struggle. Uh, it was an opportunity, though, for me to work through uh, what do we do when God does not respond in the way that we want? Right. Is our relationship with him is our understanding of him contingent upon uh, the way he answers my prayer and what i began to learn then and what i'm continuing to learn today is that god doesn't have to do anything he doesn't he he knows so much more about what i need about what my father needed he had a plan for my father i believe he revealed himself to many people through my father's struggle uh and, and I uh, have come to accept that we have every right to make requests. Uh, we have no right to make demands. I mean, how, how small would God have to be in order to negotiate with Max Lakato? I mean, that's, that's kind of like an ant really negotiating slimy. with me. You know, God is, is sovereign. He has complete control. And ultimately, we make our requests. But faith is not telling God to do what I want. Faith is really just trusting God to do what is right. Hmm. So, Max, I have been fortunate to spend the last 15 years traveling quite a bit as a speaker and in front of live a couple million people. And, and as you know, when you share your heart with people, the cool thing is they then share their heart back with you. And most frequently after events, I'll hear the, the heartache that is on so many people's hearts. And so I want to share with you right now just a few stats that these are the big macro stats, but they reflect the micro pain. And the first one's going to be about loneliness. You write, you, you speak, you preach quite a bit on loneliness. But the very first is that 61% of Americans felt lonely in 2019. Another 64%, more than half, feels that they have no one with them whom they can share their truth with. So here we are in the most digitally connected time, historic of all time by far. We all know everybody and we know what's going on in their backyard. And yet 64% of us are doing life by ourselves. Can you just speak to that for us? And isolation has only increased, right, John? Because of the pandemic, because of everything we faced in 2020 and 2021. Anxiety is at an all time high, depression is at an all-time high and the saddest statistic by far is that there uh, there are more suicides now than there have been in any era uh, since world war ii mm. so this is a this is a very tough time and 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 it's almost like a inflection point in history uh, who are we to say exactly when an inflection point occurs but your point you, the irony of what you're stating is absolutely profound that we are more connected and yet more lonely than than any other time in our history. Um, you, people who know I'm a pastor won't be surprised to hear me say this, but I really believe that ultimately loneliness begins by developing a relationship with the one who made us that leads then to a relationship with those around us. That we need to have a, a relationship that is vertical before we can have relationships that are horizontal. And there's a reason for that. If we can understand who made us and we can understand uh, what his purpose is uh, for us on this earth, that we're here but for a short time to love our neighbor and to love him and to be prepared for eternity, I think that equips us to be better uh, in our relationships with other people. Oftentimes we count on people to do for us what only God can do. Uh, people cannot bring Max Lakato forgiveness. Uh, people cannot bring Max Lakato meaning. 
Uh, I, I I know that people often think if I had a child or if I was married or if I if I had more friends, I would feel for more deep satisfaction in my life. And certainly that helps. But but only God can go to those deepest parts of our lives. And so what what I would urge people to do is open yourself up to the possibility of a loving God who cares about you. I know that likely you've been burned. Maybe somebody who called themselves religious uh, was was the one who hurt you. And I'm, I'm so very, very sorry for that. I really am. I would still urge you, however, to open yourself up to a possibility of a good God who loves you and a, a, a supernatural, even a mystical relationship with him uh, so you can talk to him and yeah. he can talk to you. And uh, you can find deep, deep satisfaction. Could it be that this this time of isolation, this time of quarantine, this time of mask wearing, that God could use this to draw you closer to him? And that someday you'll look back on these days of uh, pandemic and political chaos as a time in which you really began to, to seek God and you found a vibrant, lasting uh, relationship with him. We're going to pivot from quoting Max Lucado for a moment to our friends at the CDC. They got uh, quite a bit of press recently with COVID-19, and so they've been in the papers. But I think this next step that you're about to see should be broadcast much more clearly, and then we should talk about what the solution to it is. Max, you write about it a lot, so let's let's talk about the stat. The stat is around anxiety. 36.9% of U.S. adults have struggled within the past week with anxiety and a shocking 59.8% of young people, 18 to 25, have struggled with an anxiety in the past seven days. The pandemic was here long before COVID-19 showed up. And part of that pandemic is this feeling of loneliness and isolation. Part of this though is also anxiety. Max, why is the level of anxiety so high in our society right now, in particular among young people? I think there are two or three reasons. Thanks for bringing this topic up. I think it's so. Just yesterday, I got a text from a dear, dear friend. He said, my daughter's home from college. She's battling anxiety so severely she doesn't want to get in the car and go back to the campus. Uh, it's everywhere. One one reason is that uh, we le- we're leading lives that are very, very fast. Uh, when you think about it, my parents, your parents, our grandparents, uh, life was at a slower pace uh, for all of history up until the industrial age. Uh, people went to bed. Their world calmed down mm-hmm. when the sun went down. Uh, you could only go as far on a given day as a horse could take you. And then you had to stop. But now we find ourselves, like I found myself just night before last, stuck in an airport in Dallas at 10 p.m. wanting to be home. But the flight was late, delayed because of a storm. It was stressful. That's that's just commonplace these days. Uh, so so life is, is very, very fast. And then a second reason is we have more information coming at us than any other generation in history. You know, think about it. Uh, for my grandfather, great-grandfather, uh, living in Texas, uh, had there been an, I don't know, a tsunami on the other side of the world, if they ever heard about it at all, it would be weeks, maybe months later, and they read about it in a, in a newspaper. Now, I mean, the minute it's happening, it appears on our screens, it appears on our mobile phones, and we get the impression that bad things are happening everywhere around us, and, and, and we want to, to just, I don't know, just run and hide. And then I think a, a, a third reason is, um, again, I'm a pastor, so this one won't surprise you. I, I think secularization or the life of a, a worldview that discounts either the presence of a loving God or the existence of God at all, a, a worldview that dismisses God, that's a, that's a hard life to live. I mean, that's a hard life to live. I'm, I'm not saying that, that people who, who are pure secularists uh, are not thinking, they've not thought it through, but I, I would suggest that's a, that's a tough road to hoe uh, because you're saying it's all up to me. It's all up to me and there's no outside strength. Nobody to whom I can go, nobody upon whom I can call, no, no supernatural help or hope, no message of truth that would come into my life. And so in our increasingly secular society, uh, it, 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 it's no wonder that we have more anxiety 
And so those are the three reasons that, that you know, that they come to my mind. We have more news than ever. We're going faster than we ever have. And, and we've, uh, for many people, have either dismissed the, exist, uh, the presence of God or at least the presence of a loving God f- from our lives. Hmm. Well, you add up one plus two and it's going to lead to three, which is a stat around happiness or maybe the lack thereof happiness in the wealthiest society in the history of the world. Two out of three Americans identify today as being unhappy. Max, you you wrote an entire book around how happiness happens. So uh, share with us first. I think you've already kind of hinted, but why not go a little bit deeper into why are we so unhappy these days? And, and ultimately, what can we turn toward that might bring a little bit more joy and peace and happiness into our lives? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. And it seems to me if we have to narrow it down to just you know, a short, simple answer. It has to do with unmet expectations, that we just have expectations out of life that that simply go unfulfilled. We thought marriage would bring happiness, or we thought a new job would bring happiness, or we thought a job, uh, a transfer or a promotion, uh, and then and then we get them, and it just simply it just simply doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, we have the tendency to assume. Uh, that maybe I'm just not supposed to be happy. And, and, and our, our, our uh, hope, our aspirations can be replaced by uh, despair and, and cynicism. Mm. And, and so I think, I think un, unmet expectations are, are very, very uh, important in this conversation. Uh, and I get that. I get that. You know, we all have unmet expectations. Uh, I know enough of your story uh, to know that what has uh, changed your life was something you never expected. I know my father never aspired to spend three or four years with a crippling disease. Uh, just about three or four weeks ago, I got diagnosed with a ascending aortic aneurysm in my heart and it, and or in the aorta. And it's pretty big. And it's certainly not anything that I was expecting. And so we have these surprises that come into our world that we did not welcome, we did not seek, but we cannot avoid. And so I keep going back to the character of God. Uh, We can either dismiss God or we can say God doesn't care or we can say God is small and he couldn't handle this one. Or we could open ourselves up to the possibility that there is a great and loving God who has truly prepared us, not just for this life. In fact, this life is just a speck of sand compared to the to the beach of sand uh, that we're going to live for eternity. And, and, and we can trust him not only to use this uh, to develop our character, but to somehow use this to spread his goodness to others. We all want God to give us blessings, but sometimes he allows burdens to come our way. He has reasons that we'll never know. But, but the reasons we do know are that he intends it for our good and for his glory. Max, you've only written uh, 150 million books worthy of, of quotes that I could have borrowed from as we get ready to wrap up. So it was really hard identifying just a couple to, um, to share with our community and for you to unpack with us live. But I pulled out a couple. And uh, one of my favorites is this. It's about a man who wants to lead in orchestra. You may or may not remember saying this and writing it, but you did, and it's beautiful. A man who wants to lead the orchestra must turn his back on the crowd. I'm going to say that one more time so our community hears it clearly. But a man who wants to lead the orchestra must turn his back on the crowd. What does that mean? Well, critics come in life. Uh, Just this week, I've had two conversations uh, with with uh, men, uh, in this case, both of them were men, but it could be a man or a woman. And these two men each lead up large organizations. One has uh, over a thousand employees. Uh, the other pastors a church of several thousand people. And uh, both of them are under criticism right now because of decisions they've made. I don't want to get into the decisions or even the topics, but but they've both been around long enough. They're old guys like yours truly. I'm 66 years old. But they've been around long enough to know that this just comes with the territory. You know, they they made decisions that were not very popular, that are not very popular. But you know what? They thought through the decision. They tested it with their team, with their leadership team, and then they pulled the trigger. 
They made the call. They went down a certain track. A lot of people wanted them to go the other way, and they got really uh, some some harsh criticism as a result. But both of them made similar comments, and that is, you know, I signed up for this. Uh, I, I don't like it when I love, you know, we all love to be liked, and they both said, I don't like it when people don't like me, but this was the right call. And I think that's an important uh, characteristic. That's not just for people who head up large organizations. That's for a mom. That's for a dad. That's for a Boy Scout master. That's for a school teacher. Anybody who's responsible to lead uh, some other people has to turn their back on popularity or, or, or the crowd. So if you're in that situation, if you're leading people and you find yourself uh, being criticized, then think through, did, did, I, did, I, did I analyze the decision? Think through the way you made the decision. Uh, be open even to reconsidering the decision if you need to. But if you feel at peace with what you have chosen to do, then just move forward. Move forward. None of us, that's a thousand. But we all need to step up and swing the bat. And uh, and when you're involved in, in leading people, uh, sometimes you'll hit a home run. Uh, sometimes you won't. But we, we, we that just comes with the territory. And I will remind our friends who are tuning in right now on all the various social streams. If you are enjoying this program, do me a favor and share and comment and like it right now so that those who hang with you digitally can also benefit from this conversation. So this is brought to you today by our friends at Keeley Companies. And I'll let Max know that in a moment we're going to shift gears into the Live Inspired 7. So, Max, before we go through the Live Inspired 7, there is one more quote that I wrote down. I just think it's phenomenal. And you said this, to call yourself a child of God is one thing. To be called a child of God by those who watch your life is another thing altogether. Tell me what that means. That's good stuff there. Dude, yeah, Did whoever, I write that? Tell some of those books. <laughs> yeah. It's a wonderful thing to think that we're chosen by God. It's just a wonderful thing. We stud, we, we, we all talk about our identity. Uh, there's much discussion these days about self-esteem. Uh, and I really believe that the healthiest uh, self-esteem is based in God's view of me and God's view of you. Uh, to all of you who are part of this conversation today, I'm so happy to tell you that you are known by God. You're loved by God. You're overseen by God. Uh, there's a scripture in Deuteronomy 31 and verse 8 that, that tells us that God has gone ahead of you. He has gone ahead of you and that he is preparing the way. Isn't that a wonderful thought to think that whatever challenges you face today, God is already in the midst of those challenges. He's clearing the way and you can expect to receive blessings and you can expect to receive strength. Uh, this is how much God loves you. And so don't let your self-esteem uh, be based upon what other people think of you. Please don't let it be based upon your performance, uh, what your SAT scores are, uh, what your school test scores are, what your golf game is. Uh, don't let it be based upon performance, upon your looks, upon your accomplishments. Uh, try to root your self-esteem in the simple fact that you're known by God, cherished by God, used by God. I think that that's the healthiest way to live life and it's the greatest news that there is i, I always say it's a, you know it's it, the, the big news is not god made the world but that god loves the world and yeah. you're in the world and he loves you it's a great way to part ways on that part of the conversation and shift gears into what we call the live inspired seven max locato We've had the honor of interviewing some of the great leaders from around the world, and I have the honor of having one of them on the show with us today. His name is Max Lucado, and the question to him, question number one, for a mighty author and minister, preacher, and human being, what is the most influential or maybe one of the best books, Max, you've ever read? Um, well, you, you know, I'll answer the Bible. Right? I figured that might happen. Yeah. Um, but assuming that, uh, what, when I entered the ministry uh, many years, 40 years ago now, my father gave me a, a set of commentaries. Uh, they are the William Barclay commentaries on the New Testament. Uh, I did not know that somebody could make the Bible come alive so much. Uh, William Barclay, uh, a Britisher, 
uh, wrote these commentaries. I, I don't test me on this. I want to say in the 1950s, uh, 1960s. Mm. Uh, but boy, they're just a delight to read. They're not heavy. Uh, they they help me to see uh, that God's word could be an encouragement. But he wrote this commentary set on the entire New Testament. So I think I think that was a pivotal. It's been a while since I pulled them off the shelf and read them, but. When I did read them early on, they helped me understand uh, the the ability to present Scripture in a lively fashion. Mm. What is one positive characteristic or trait that you possessed as a little boy growing up in Andrews, Texas, <laughs> that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? Oh, I wish. I yeah. I I I think I really played well. I was a good player. I mean, I'd run and jump on my bike. I'd be on my bike all day. I joined every possible athletic team, even though I wasn't a great. I need to do that better. I need to do that better. But a good play. We need to play. We got to play. Max, if your home caught fire, your family's out safely, the animals are out safely, you had an opportunity to run in and grab one item that really mattered to you. What's the one thing you would grab? I would grab my Bible. I would. Uh, it's got so many notes in it, so many thoughts in it, so many reflections. I I, I would hate to lose that the the current Bible. I've had the, this Bible uh, since the year 2000, so 20 21 years now. Uh, I, I've I would grab. I, I would go straight to the desk and grab that. If you, with that Bible in hand, could sit on a bench on a perfect day, and have a long conversation with anyone, living or dead. Who would you want to be seated next to? I, I would. We've talked about our fathers a lot today, haven't we? Boy, I'd love to have a good visit with him. Ask him a few more questions about life. I, I, I think that would be a, a rare and wonderful privilege. I, I would also, there are so many Bible characters who fascinate me. I just wrote a book on the life of Esther <laughs> uh, called You Were Made for This Moment. Uh, her story is a fascinating story. But uh, but I guess I'd go first to my dad and then to some of the Bible characters. Any, as you sit next to your dad, was there anything left unsaid? Something you wish, now that you're a man and you have your own children and grandchildren, something that you recognize, gosh, I wish I would have told dad this. I can't think of that. but I, I can't think of anything because I did have that opportunity. Uh, I spent uh, several days at his at, at his side just before he died. So I was very, very grateful for that. I, I, I would like to ask him uh, to be quite frank, some questions about discipline. Uh, he, he was a good man, but he was a harsh disciplinarian. He did not spare the rod. Uh, and I've struggled with that through the years. Is that, is, was there a reason that he, um, was that just a generational thing? Uh, but I, I would like to hear his explanation for Maybe I was just so obnoxious that he needed to spank it out of me. <laughs> you were playing too much, man. Maybe that was a Maybe I was. What's the best advice that dad or mom or anybody else that you respected ever offered you? So best advice you've ever received? Uh, you, you know that life is short and that's okay. Life is short. It really is. It's just moving it at, at such speed. You know, uh, we all grow up hearing things and we say, boy, when I get old, I'm not going to say that. I hear that so much. And then we all end up saying it. I end up saying that, too. I want to tell dads, hey, your time with your kids, you only have a short time with them. Uh, I want to say to husbands, you know, your wife, you're not going to be with her forever. Make sure she knows today that she's loved. Uh, and so time is really, really fleeing fast. And as you get older, it seems to go even faster. So take full advantage of, of every single day. Mm. What advice would you offer your 20 year old self? Mm. Trust God's great grace. Let him forgive you. Uh, I, 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 the Christian story, of course, is built around the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And uh, when I heard the Easter story growing up, for some reason, I was never one of those who doubted that Christ rose from the dead. I figured if God was on the earth, sure, he can come from the dead. Uh, but I did not think he could forgive a jerk like me. I just really didn't. I was a scoundrel. And so I, I, I think that would be the advice I would give me. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, if you don't trust God's great grace, the scripture says, be strong in the grace that is yours in Christ Jesus. Uh, if you don't trust it, then, uh, 
You're missing out on the great love of God. Grace is, is God's gift to us. It's his unmerited favor. I think it's his best, best gift. So I would urge myself to trust it more quickly. Well, we're going to get into the seventh question in a moment. I finished reading a book just last night by a guy named Max Lucado titled, You Were Made for This Moment. And then underneath that, Max, courage for today, hope for tomorrow. The time is right for that book. So I do want to encourage our listeners, viewers, and, and readers to check out Made for This Moment. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. I don't know how you keep doing this, but it's another phenomenal book. So Max Lucado is our time together, unfortunately, comes to an end. The final question part of the Live Inspired 7 is this. It has been said that all great preachers, teachers, thinkers, authors, human beings can have their lives summed up in one sentence. Max Lucado, yes. how would you like your one sentence to read? Boy, you've got the greatest questions. Wow, John. You, no wonder you're so popular. That's a great question. Here, here's my answer to that. Life is short and then it's past and only what's done for Christ will last. That's an epitaph that I found in a book, and I might put that one on my gravestone. It's one that certainly fits you, Max. We want to thank you for doing your work, doing it courageously, doing it in the midst of the storm, and uh, reminding us that we were made for this moment, and our best days are in front of us. Thank you, my friend. All the very best to you and all of you. My friends, you just heard from Max Lucado. I want to thank him for joining our show today, and I want to thank each of you for joining us today along the journey. Thank you, Keeley Companies, for making today's production a possibility. And remember, this is your day. The foundation is firm. The headwind is real, but the best is yet to come. God bless you guys. Have an awesome afternoon.